So today we have Larry Williams. He is a horticulture extension agent in Okaloosa County. I've known Larry um, for the whole time I've been in extension, which is 20 something years plus. Uh, Larry has been uh, uh, in Okaloosa County for 30 years. And prior to that, he had done eight years in extension at the University of Georgia. He does root for the red and black team on Saturdays. He doesn't tell everybody that, but now you know. Uh, he has had an accomplished career there and continues to run an excellent program in Crestview, Florida, um, right there in Okaloosa, if you're wondering where it is. That's also where Destin, Florida is, that county. So if, you, if you're not familiar with that part of Florida, that's where that location is. And he's a, a really great writer. I always like to read Larry's blogs and his articles in uh, Gardening in the Panhandle and his um, great newspaper articles too. He's a, He's got a great uh, writing style and is a fabulous educator. So Larry, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and I'm going to invite you to share. And um, we're just so happy that you could be with us um, at the Master Gardener State webinar. Thank you, Wendy. And let me this in presentation mode. How's um, that? It's Perfect now. Perfect now. Great. Larry, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself. And after a while, I'll turn my camera off, but you have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much. I look forward to this uh, topic. I titled, titled this Tips for Growing Tasty Tomatoes. And, you know, we have expectations. People have this mental picture. And unfortunately, sometimes it's that one year that they just grew the biggest plant or the uh, most tomatoes or the uh, biggest individual tomatoes. And that's what they have in their mind as the norm. <clears throat> to to do that is unfair. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like saying, when you look at the average life expectancy of a person in, in the United States, <clears throat> finding out that someone lived to be 110 and say, well, you know, that you, to, to make the extreme the average or norm is not fair to anyone. And there's so many things that are wrong with that picture, um, but it, it, it is a real picture. And it also shows the perennial nature of tomatoes. Um, they're, they're not annuals. When you begin growing tomatoes, if you're new to Florida, if you're new to growing a vegetable garden, uh, new to growing tomato plants, you need to learn some things about the reality of what we face in the state of Florida. So we have temperature extremes. And, and I, I'm up, I'll mention this a number of times related to temperature. I live and, and grow vegetable gardens and those kinds of things up in extreme Northwest Florida. So that is different. The weather, particularly the temperature is different in the panhandle compared to central Florida and certainly compared to South Florida and, and you know, the keys. So you've got to, kind of know your own weather, the moisture extremes, and I think all of us deal with that. Uh, we hear the month of May is typically a dry month, but we can have feast or famine. Uh, it can be way too much water and way too little. Humidity is a factor that we just have to deal with. Uh, sandy soils, most of Florida, that's what Florida is known for, uh, can be a real challenge. The light exposure, sometimes we can control that a little bit, but I'll show a couple of examples where you really can't uh, pull off growing tomatoes or vegetables because the site that you might have ha you know, could possibly have too many trees. The pest pressure varies from year to year. It's not the same. So if you're an engineer type, where you want a cookie cutter type approach or calendar approach, it varies every year. You might have one pest that is, uh, you know, at its peak one season, the very next year, you don't see that same pest. So that varies. And then plant competition, I'll explain that a little more. You need to understand the plant family. Tomatoes are in the Solanaceae family and uh, the nightshade family. And here are other plants that are in that same family, the tomato, the pepper, eggplant, the potato. Now we're not, we're not talking about the uh, sweet potato here, which is a completely different plant family. This is the what I call the Irish potato or spring potato, you know, new potato. They're they're all Irish potatoes, white potato. Believe it or not, tobacco is in this same family. 
petunia, you might have some petunias that you grow for color in, in the landscape, in, in your garden. And then the nightshade family, which the this family, the Solanaceae family, is uh, also called the nightshade family. Some interesting history there behind that with the family, but um, here's a chart showing the various plant families. So to practice true crop rotation, which is important if you can do it, even in raised beds, making note of where you grew, say for example, tomatoes one or two, three years in a row and intentionally rotating with something that isn't a completely different plant family. So for example, in that nightshade family, the Solanaceae family, you have eggplants, pepper, potato, that's Irish potato, tomato, tomatillo. If you were growing tomatoes in a part of your garden and you rotated with eggplant, that's not true crop rotation. Um, if you rotated with pepper, that's not true crop rotation because they're from the same plant family. So to practice true crop rotation and get the benefits of crop rotation, you need to pick plants from another family. Now, some of these are cool season. Tomatoes are warm season. For example, that parsley family, uh, most if not all of those plants are cool season plants. Um, you're not going to be you know, growing those as a, a summer or spring garden typically. So you could rotate with beans, for example, or okra um, the, from a completely different family. And even it, this practice of crop rotation goes back centuries, even probably thousands of years ago. I, I know that it's even mentioned in the Old Testament in the Bible. So it's, it's still modern time, a good practice. Then you need to look at the plant itself, the habit. So a lot of, I find out a lot of home growers don't really know what determinant tomatoes are. And it's interesting that the state of Florida grows more tomatoes commercially, that's fresh market tomatoes, not tomatoes that are canned, that you purchase as canned tomatoes, but fresh market tomatoes. Florida is number one in, in the US in growing fresh market tomatoes. So we know that it can be done. And you may live in a part of Florida where there are uh, quite a bit of farmers that grow tomatoes commercially. They mostly will grow determinate. Keep that in mind, and I'll explain why with a, an upcoming picture. But the determinate plants will have flower clusters produced with only one or two leaves. That's, you know, coming out of the node between them, the, the nodes between those leaves. They're more compact. That's kind of what I'm trying to point out there. After several clusters of flowers, the shoot will terminate in an inflorescence. Well, I'll show you a picture of that in a diagram. That's the flower cluster. And they tend to be smaller plants, more compact, that are suited for caging or even allowing them to sprawl along the ground. Fruit tends to ripen all at once. So those are characteristics of determinant. Most homeowners will grow indeterminate types. That typically is what they have available to, you know, to purchase more so than determinate. But those plants will have three to four leaves between the flower clusters. The shoots uh, do not terminate in a flower cluster. And since the plants continue to elongate, that's the picture you saw at the beginning with the expectations of people climbing up ladders and these monstrous plants in height you know, that you might get, they just continue to grow, elongate, produce more flowers and grow and continue to produce more fruit. They're suited and probably need to be staked or caged. Um, the fruit ripens throughout the growing season, unlike the determinate types. You know, farmers are not interested in climbing ladders to harvest the fruit out in the field, and they're not interested in uh, keeping the tomato plant growing. Uh, economically, it's not uh, viable or doable uh, to have those tomatoes out there as a perennial uh, growing for months and months and months. So they prefer the determinate type. And then you have this in-between type you don't find that often that sometimes is referred to as ISI, that's indeterminate short internode varieties with the controlled growth habit of a determinate, but yet they have the unlimited production potential of an indeterminate. I, you probably need to keep in mind mostly the determinant versus the indeterminate. So here's a, 
a diagram showing the difference. You see that determinant ending in that flower cluster. That's the terminal point. But yet with the indeterminate, the plant continues to grow in height and the flower cut cluster occurs off to the side. And that's the reason why one uh, is more compact and shorter. and The other, the indeterminate, continues to grow in height and to some extent in width. So here's a planting of determinate varieties. You notice that they're, they're all uniform in height. They're not uh, really that tall. They're easy to, you know, to work with, uh, harvest the fruit. But then when you look at the indeterminate, which most homeowners are accustomed to, those plants can get quite large, requiring some sort of help to even get to and harvest the plants, I mean, the tomatoes that are up in the plant later in the season as it grows. Remember that tomato plants are not annuals in their native habitat, uh, where it stays warm year round, they're not native to the, to the United States. They function as a perennial growing multiple years, producing the plant, and then eventually um, will revert slowly to that reproductive stage. We try to get manipulate the plant and have the a perennial function as an annual in our gardens and achieve everything it's going to achieve within months versus years. So that, that can be some of the challenging parts of, of growing tomatoes. So the pollination is important to understand. They basically are self-pollinated through agitation. That could be mostly wind, sometimes uh, bee activity, just agitating the flowers, call it, causing the heavy pollen to fall. And then the anthers start releasing pollen mid-morning. It's a temperature-related thing and also moisture-related, but basically you're looking at 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. when the bulk of the pollen is being released. And rainy conditions, which we, we have, um, can and late dew, can persistent late dew, can cause pollination problems. So remember that the tomato is largely self-fertilized and primarily wind-pollinated. You don't, you'll see bees and other pollinators out there, but it's not critical like it is with the uh, cucurbit family. It's cucumbers, watermelon, squash that have to be uh, primarily pollinated by insects. So there's a difference in fertilization, pollination and fertilization. We're going to take a quick look at that. It's important to understand some of the botany. The pollen, believe it or not, germinates to form a tube which grows to the ovule. That's the egg. We're gonna look at a diagram of this and having some understanding of how this works is important. Uh, it, it will almost, once you learn some of what we're about to cover in this slide and the next several slides, will make you wonder how does it even work? How do we ever get any tomato fruit at all? So fertilization must take place within 24 hours of pollination. We're going to look at the difference between pollination and fertilization. Here again is where temperature plays a role. Low, that's basically below 50 degrees Fahrenheit or high above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Night temperatures can slow down pollen tube growth and prevent fertilization. And, and that's a huge factor that we don't have really much control over. And even when you purchase some of the heat tolerant tomatoes, you're only gaining two or three degrees in temperature. It's not significant. We just can't do a whole lot about the extreme heat of summer, which creates problems with production and tomatoes and some other um, vegetable crops. So pollination is basically defined as the process by which pollen is transferred from the anther. Of course, going back to your training as a master gardener in botany, that's the male portion of the flower to the stigma, the female part, thereby enabling fertilization and reproduction. So pollination occurs first. That pollen moves from the anther, the male part of the flower, by agitation or wind movement to the stigma. And the diagram, here's the stigma. Pollen grain will land there, germinate, send down a pollen tube that grows down into the, down to the uh, ovary, and then looking more closely down here, each ovule has to be fertilized. So it's not just once that, that it has to be multiple 
um, viable pollen grains that go through this process to connect with through that pollen tube every one of these ovules and then um, fertilize that that allows that fruit to grow and form a normal tomato. When you get incomplete pollination, might be weather related, other causes, um, usually temperature related or too much nitrogen creating a very vigorous plant vegetatively. This process doesn't work correctly. So the fertilization, fertilization you see the pollen germinates to form the tube that grows to the ovule, that's the egg. Fertilization must take place within 24 hours of pollination. You got these little windows of opportunity. And then again, the low temperature or too high temperature at night um, it interferes with that pollen tube growing properly, it shortens it. So there's a lot involved with this. And you start learning that and you understand why uh, you might not be having success by planting under the heat of summer or too early if, if you're in the part of Florida I'm in, uh, if you plant too early and consistently have these colder temperatures when the plant's blooming, um, the tomato plant is a heat loving plant, it's a tropical plant in origin. So if you look at this slide, the temperature again is very critical. Days over 85, this is day temperature now, over 85 degrees Fahrenheit, nights over 75 degrees, uh, can be can result in blossom drop. Night temperatures below 55 can do that. Uh, or temperatures, actual temperatures, not heat index, but actual air temperature of 104 or greater can uh, just make it null and void, basically, on uh, producing all that that we looked at previously happening correctly, the botany of, of what happens there. Too much nitrogen, we have control over that. We're gonna take a look at that, uh, exactly how to fertilize tomatoes. Soil temperature, um, too little basically is the problem, can stress or weaken the plants. And there you go again, you start seeing the blossoms drop. Over on the right, the excess pruning. I don't like to prune tomatoes. There's reasons to do that, but um, it increased ma maintenance in growing those plants. And if you overdo it in pruning, it can result in a stress plant and, and uh, fewer fruit. Wind, that's basically a drying effect, desiccation. We have lots of drying winds on those plants. Um, light, too little or too much can result in blossom drop. Stress caused by disease in our insects, basically a weakened plant can result in poor production. Now, here are actual temperatures from March 20th 2023, we're, you know, almost about a month away from that. And th this is in Northwest Florida where I live. If you're in Central South Florida, you may not experience this, but this is the norm where I live. So in Crestview, where our extension office is located, that's the county seat for Okaloosa County. My garden at my home is about 30 miles north of Alabama, the state line. So we are in extreme North Florida, but on March 20th, 20, 2023, last year, we had, if you look at that 28 degrees, a freeze warning, Niceville, which is in Okaloosa County, about 15 miles, 15 miles south of where I live, experienced freezing weather that same night. Fort Walton Beach, which is a good 30 miles south of where I live, closer to the coast, um, experienced 32 degrees that same night with a freeze warning. But compare that to New York City. Isn't that amazing? Uh, the same night. In our local lows, it's common to see this in March. They come in, they've got all the you know tomatoes and peppers and squash plants, the very cold, sensitive plants out kind of in the open. So they have to go and cover those when we have those kinds of nights. That may not be what you see or experience, but the point is temperature is critical and sometimes we want to plant too quickly or too soon based on what our local, not only the air temperature, but what the soil temperature will allow. You're dealing with a plant that's tropical and that appreciates adequately warm soil. So where I live in Okaloosa County, again, extreme Northwest Florida, 
I typically will not put a tomato plant in the ground until after April 1st. I want that soil temperature to adequately warm so the plant takes off and it all comes together and works. So once you, you know, learn a little bit about that, then you've got to choose a site to grow your plants. And ideally it needs to be near the house and a water source for convenience. You can observe and see what's going on out there. If you want to walk out, you know, to pick some fresh tomatoes, it's an easy walk to, uh, to use in a salad or for, you know, bacon tomato sandwich, whatever you're using it for. It needs to be open to good air movement and that goes back to diseases. Uh, most of our fungal diseases have to have adequate moisture. If the plants do not dry out quickly after a rain or after heavy dew, they stay wet for a lengthy period of time. Here comes the fungal diseases. Full sun, you can't pull off growing most vegetables if you have too, too little hours of sunlight. So basically you're looking for greater than five to six hours per day, the site where you choose to grow tomatoes or other vegetables. It needs to be away from competing tree roots. And if you look at the pictures there, those pictures were taken from research done in Florida by Dr. Ed Gilman, a former tree researcher with UF. And we know based on that and probably 60 years worth of tree root excavation all over this country, that some trees have deep roots, but most of those roots will be close to the surface for the uh, ability to take in oxygen. And uh, most of the tree roots are concentrated actually in the upper foot of soil. So they can be very competitive with roots from tomatoes or anything else that you're trying to grow in close proximity to those trees. It's not just shade that's competitive. And you look at the bottom picture, roots can extend up to three times the drip line of the tree. They extend out uh, a, a lot a greater distance than some people realize. So consider tree shade as well. Be careful to not overlime your garden. That continues when you look at the bullet statements. Um, you need well-drained soils and you need a soil pH between 6 and 6.5. That's the optimal pH range for growing tomatoes and actually for most vegetables. So the asterisk points out, be careful to not overline your garden. I was talking to a gentleman that came in our office earlier this week, I think it was on Monday, and he came from New Jersey and he was following the practice of putting lime out every year. He'd never had his pH tested. You don't do that. You want a soil test, don't guess. If you jack that pH up too high, you're stuck for a long time and it's not easily changed. And some people do not realize that not only lime is a agent to raise the pH, more the most common that is purchased for the purpose of changing the soil pH from a low pH to a higher pH, but wood ashes are pound for pound are almost equivalent to applying lime. They're alkaline and they raise the pH of the soil. Mushroom compost is an alkaline material. We've tested a lot of mushroom compost, which is a substrate that they use to grow mushrooms commercially. And it got to be pretty popular for the home gardener to find a source of spent mushroom compost to put out in their garden. But it normally has a pH of seven or above. And if you overdo it and you don't know the soil pH to begin with, it's already too high and you put any of these materials out, it's only gonna make matters worse. So that's critical. And if you have this sort of situation, um, just standing water, I put below that poor drainage equals poor tomato production, but that's true with most vegetables. I would tell you good luck in that situation. It's just not going to work if you have an area, a site that holds water like you see in that picture. And then the area on the right, you know, Florida is a forest ecosystem, a tremendous diversity of trees. And if you have too many trees, I'll say good luck as well. You have to have that minimal of five to six hours minimal of sunlight to pull off growing most vegetables, including tomatoes. So too much shade, too much root competition, it's just not gonna work. After you choose the correct site, then you're ready to make your mind up on what cultivars that you want to grow. And there's considerations. You have disease resistance or tolerance. We're gonna to take a look at that. Personal preference, 
preference plays a role. I would even add there that uh, maybe check with your family, um, see what they prefer. I mean, you've got the little cherry tomatoes, the grape tomatoes, the sli what I call slicing tomatoes. You have to make your mind up on which one do we really prefer. And then hybrid versus heirloom. We'll take a look at some of the heirloom types, determinate versus indeterminate. We've already covered that. Let's take a quick look at the heirloom. Heirloom can be defined by these bullet statements. Uh, they come about either through families, passing them down. These are seeds that have been passed down from uh, you know, generation through a family, generations. Sometimes they're not even named. They just save the seeds. Commercial, they're done per on purpose. They're open pollinated varieties that were introduced before 1940 be called an heirloom. They're created, they do that by crossing two known parents and dehybridizing those, resulting in seeds for however many years or generation it takes to eliminate the undesirable characteristics. And then there's mystery varieties that just, uh, you know, people don't no longer know what the name happens to be, but they're, they're cross-pollinated by other heirloom varieties. More specifically, the heirloom varieties they are more lobed and undulated. And I have some pictures. All of these pictures, by the way, came from my 2023, last year's most recent garden that I had. And the uh, some of these, most of these are heirloom varieties. Um, they are open pollinated. They're more, more prone to diseases and fruit cracking. As you can see, my hand holding that heirloom variety, and I forget which one, it's either the Cherokee purple or the German queen, but see that cracking that occurs, that's more characteristic. They grow so large and so rapidly, sometimes that happens. It's still usable if you pick it soon enough and, and, and use the tomato. The one in the picture below is one that I grew, and they're not the prettiest. Heirloom tomatoes are not the prettiest. You may, uh, you know, might leave them at the grocery store compared to some of the hybrid types, but they taste differently. Look at the size of this one. It's a good four inches are a little better in width. If you slice that in the center, that will fully cover a typical uh, 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 piece of uh, uh, loaf bread for sandwich. Um, good luck doing that with the cherry tomatoes or grape tomatoes. I've asked people, how many cherry tomatoes does it take to make a bacon tomato sandwich? I don't have to have the lettuce on it. One of my favorite sandwiches is a, uh, a bacon tomato sandwich, but I want a good slice of bacon and some good uh, crispy bacon and a little bit of mayonnaise, making myself hungry around lunchtime. But they are more prone to uh, diseases. They produce tomatoes within 75 to 110 days. Examples, brandy wine, which you would expect to be harvesting tomatoes about 100 days after you plant the seeds. And there's some examples of some heirloom types in that web link at the bottom of this uh, slide is, is not UF Extension, but it, it's a good site that uh, includes a surprising number of heirloom tomatoes. The picture with the grouping of tomatoes, I should mention, these five tomatoes, or let's see, uh, five, are all heirloom types that I grew in my most recent uh, garden. These are not heirloom, the, the three yellow, that is a lemon boy, which was the first time that I you know, tried those. And they, they were kind of a sweet, mild tomato taste. The heirloom types that I grew were more of a uh, very uh, nice tomato taste that were more acidic. And the three at the bottom were some um, hybrid tomatoes. I forget which, hybrid, which the names, but they were smaller and uh, didn't have quite the flavor that the heirloom tomatoes had. So another part of choosing your plants versus seed, you can seed tomato seeds, but you've, you've selected your variety that you want to grow, and then you want to pl uh, uh, purchase a good quality plant. So the age or size is important. You're looking at five to six weeks, the plant that's not overly big, that's not too old. The size would be basically five to seven inches in height. That's ideal for planting. 
you want it pest free. If you looking through some plants at the garden center and they're spotted, the leaves are spotted and they look like they're diseased, the leaves are yellow, they're wilted, I would probably look for some other plants. Don't bring those diseases home to uh, spread in your garden. The color should be a healthy green color, basically dark green. And take a look at the roots. Uh, we pulled this, when I did this slide, we pulled this tomato out of the container and look at that white root, a good fibrous root system, but healthy roots are almost white in color. Avoid old, oversized, large plants uh, that, that can be too old to really bother with. So now you've selected your site, your plants, you're ready to put them in the ground, the plants. This happens to be a raised bed, which I've moved to more raised bed gardening myself, but it could be in a traditional in-ground garden or in containers. But you want to take time and be careful in handling those plants. Don't overdo it in pressing, pulling the plant out of the container with these container plants using the stem. It's, they're very easily to crush um, and, and damage, so handle it carefully. Put it in the ground, basically at the same depth it was growing in the container. You can set a tomato plant a little deeper than that, but you don't have to. Um, and then make sure the day that you plant these, within hours, preferably, give it a good watering to water it in. Don't walk away from it and say, well, I'll water it tomorrow. Speaking of watering, we're moving into cultural practices after you have your plants going. And there's lots of ways of watering. I typically will use hand watering like you see on the left with, I like the, uh, the little ex extended wand that you can hook onto, attached to the end of a water hose. Um, you can water your plants that way. I use that. I use drip irrigation. The upper right picture is an old way of watering using a hose end sprinkler that oscillates. And it's, it's not as efficient. It throws a lot of water up into the air and you lose some through evaporation off site. It's just not as efficient as using hand watering, watering the individual plants or using drip irrigation. If you haven't used drip irrigation, I would challenge you to, uh, Incorporate that and try it. Uh, I think you'll like it. Continue with irrigation. You want to water early in the day. That's true with any of our vegetable plants. That's to minimize disease problems. Most of our fungal diseases have to have a lengthy period of time that the plants remain wet, and that promotes fungal diseases. You want the plant to dry out after watering, so early morning watering does that. Sun comes out plants dry out, they don't stay wet through the night. Late evening watering is less desirable because the plants remain wet throughout the night and don't dry out until the next morning, providing that extended period of time to allow the, uh, fungal diseases to uh, begin to uh, take over your garden, essentially. Young plants need about one inch of water. Rain counts, if you're getting plenty of rainfall, Count that, put a rain gauge out there, know how much rain you got that week, but young plants need basically one inch of water per week. You wanna apply it frequently, not one saturation, but incrementally throughout the week when you're dealing with young plants to keep that root area evenly moist. After you're dealing with mature plants, remember that the plants, the water demand goes up, not only because you're dealing with a larger plant, but now you've got production, you've got, tomatoes on the plant that that plant has to support. Typically it's warmer temperatures. You've moved from springtime into the consistently hot days of summer. So the demand for water increases, but rain still counts. If you're getting plenty of rainfall, you don't need to put additional water out. Um, mature plants will need about two inches of water per week. And you want to apply, apply that infrequently. Notice the difference between getting the young plants established with frequent watering one inch per week to maintaining established plants, two inches per week, but infrequently. Continue with cultural practices. Sometimes I mulch, sometimes I don't, but here are the benefits of mulching. It helps retain soil moisture. It reduces weeds. It moderates the soil temperature. And I think that's an important factor, but more importantly is the last bullet statement, less fruit diseases. It minimizes contact with the soil in the plant. And there's some diseases 
There's a common fungal disease it's called early blight disease. It's called early blight and septoria leaf spot. Both of those diseases begin on the plant by soil splashing with the uh, fungal spores in the soil, splashing onto those lower leaves. Hence that disease first starts on the lower portion of the plant. So putting that mulch layer gives you some protection uh, from bare soil splashing up onto those lower leaves so it can actually minimize or reduce some of the disease problems. This, these pictures are from my most recent garden and it has to do with staking. And most of the time, tomato plants do benefit from being staked or supported in some way. So um, I use mostly these wood stakes, one inch by one inch wood stakes. And um, you wanna start early, and I use twine to continue to tie them up to that stake. These are just a couple of examples. You can look up online how to support tomato plants and it's almost your imagination is the limit. The bottom picture, I have a question in there. Do you see a problem here? The problem is look at the opening size in that fence that they use to form a cage to support that tomato plant. Good luck putting your hand through that and being able to successfully pull out that slicing tomato when it's ready to harvest. And, and the cage is too high to lean over <laughs> and, and, and get those lower tomatoes. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, you need to have access to those tomatoes for harvesting. Uh, fertilizing is critical. Uh, a lot of homeowners have the tendency to over-fertilize and basically you, you can broadcast the fertilizer over the entirety of the bed, whether it's a traditional in-ground uh, bed or a raised bed, uh, even in uh, container plants, growing tomatoes in containers and pots, essentially. If I were growing tomatoes in pots, I would rely on using a liquid fertilizer like miracle Grow or Peter's fertilizer because it's just too too easy to, to burn the plants if you use a traditional garden granular fertilizer in containers. So you have the, just throwing the fertilizer out there, broadcasting it versus this slide that tries to describe what is meant by side dressing. Side dressing involves usually making a shallow furrow along the side of the row. This is with corn and then putting the appropriate amount of fertilizer in that furrow and covering it over. Um, that's called side dressing. But whether you're broadcasting the fertilizer or side dressing, you want to make sure that you're not overdoing it. Soil sample can tell you exactly, fine tune and tell you exactly what you need in the way of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Primarily the, the phosphorus and potassium uh, can be an issue. This slide shows a, it, this came from a commercial. Remember I said that uh, Florida grows more tomatoes commercially, the, the fresh market tomatoes in any state in, in the country. And that drives research. It's an economically important crop. So there's been a lot of research by the University of Florida in looking at tomato production. And this was done to see exactly what is needed by the plant at different stages. And it's real interesting if you take a look at this. These, this was from fresh petiole sap concentration where they actually were looking for what was in the plant, the parts per million of, of nitrogen and potassium. So the young plant at the first bud, this is what the plant wants. About 1,200 parts per million nitrogen. And look at the amount of potassium. Continue to look at this as the plant matures and the flowers begin to form. It goes into two, from a uh, vegetative phase of growth to a reproductive phase of growth. It doesn't want as much nitrogen, but it wants to continue receiving adequate potassium. That's the, that's the take home lesson on this slide. And what the homeowner does, and that progressively goes down, look at that nitrogen at the second harvest. It only wants 200 to 400 parts per million of nitrogen, but yet look at the amount of potassium the plant wants. If you overdo it with nitrogen, you continue to push the plant with nitrogen, you end up with a green, vigorous plant that stays in a vegetative state of growth at the expense of producing fruit. 
and it can actually cause the flowers to shed and uh, end up with this over overly vigorous plant with little to no tomato production. So as the plants mature, you want to slowly decrease the amount of nitrogen you're giving the plant. Here's an example of what we're talking about. The, too much nitrogen results in a big green, you could say ugly plant even, with few to no fruit. Who wants that? Um, I don't. Let's move to some of the common disease problems. Two, two of the most challenging diseases that we have, and again, the University of Florida and other land-grant universities have worked on some of these disease problems trying to develop resistance within tomato plants, but you have bacterial wilt. This bacterial disease is naturally occurring. It's a native uh, bacteria in our soil here in the Southeast. And tomatoes are not native to the Southeastern United States. That's kind of interesting. This picture in the center shows you a diagnostic putting uh, tomato in a uh, clear container, that's a test tube, but you could have a jar or clear glass of water and you take the lower portion of the plant that's wilting, it's critical to get the part that was at ground level. The top of the plant's been removed for ease of putting it in that container. And you start seeing this milky streaming. It's a cloudy oozing. That's called bacterial oozing. It's a 100% diagnosis of bacterial wilt. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news when a person brings this into the office and do this test, usually under warmer weather, and tell them, well, unfortunately, you can no longer grow tomatoes on that site. Um, then we have the disease on the right that's tomato spotted wilt virus that's vectored by thrips. And by the way, the word thrips is plural and singular. There's no such thing as a thrip. It doesn't sound right, but a Individual thrip is called thrips. <laughs> There's the symptoms that you see uh, with this virus disease. And all that we really have in offering help with either one of these diseases is to intentionally look for resistance. So here are some tomato varieties that use the same gene. Scientists have found out that there's a specific gene it's called or referred to as the SW5 gene that they're manipulating, or if they found actually in some uh, a wild tomato that they can put in to these tomatoes to result in a resistant variety. And it does make significant difference in resistance. I like the variety Amelia, and I have found those plants available locally at some of the box stores and garden centers. It has uh, high resistance to the um, this virus, and you see some other varieties to look for cultivars. Here's an additional one that gives you some of the varieties that have bacterial wilt resistance. And that's really what you need to look for if you're dealing with either one of these problems. Remember that the heirloom varieties don't have this in, in their genetics. They're more disease prone. So look for tomatoes with good res a resistant package. They've had some success with using this metallized malt, sometimes referred to as silver, silver, aluminized, or UV reflective mulch. It's difficult for the homeowner to get small quantities of this, but what happens is that reflection, you put it um, the silver side up underneath it's black, it confuses the thrips. They navigate and find those flowers, the yellow flowers, and that reflective mulch confuses them. And this is proven to be like 70% effective in reducing tomato spotted wilt vi virus, even on susceptible varieties. You have a whole host of insects to deal with. If you plant tomatoes, they will come. But I want to show you in the great publication, it's called the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. Uh, on EDIS, as a master gardener, you should be familiar with this. It has this chart or table in there. And I want to make sure you get a copy of this. And it, it gives you what materials to use, some more organic, others more traditional, to help control some of the insect pests. Um, but I'll show you another slide that I highly recommend. This one's out of place. Let, I, the next one I should not have had in there. This 
This one, I tell people when I do presentations, sometimes I'll even bring these three products with me to do a quick presentation for at the garden club, civic group, community organization. Uh, just one of those 20 minute presentations. You can do this as a master gardener. You bring in examples of an insecticidal soap, a horticultural oil, and then Bacillus thuringiensis. That's a bac uh, bacteria that um, is helpful in controlling lepidopterous insects. That's your, you know, the caterpillars, basically. I think that all homeowners should have these three items in their arsenal for controlling insect pests. Now, the copper-based fungicide, I would caution you, do a soil test through the University of Florida Soils Lab to see where you are on copper in the soil. Copper just doesn't go away. And that's the problem with using a copper-based fungicide. If you overuse it, you jack the copper uh, up in the soil. It ends up in the soil and it builds up in the soil. And it, it is an essential plant element at low levels but once it gets too high, it becomes toxic to the plant. And it's very difficult, even maybe not possible, to reverse that once you, you allow that copper level to go up too high. So again, don't guess soil test. One of the challenging insects happens to be uh, stink bugs. And, and these, these insects can be confusing. Um, you have... An example, stink bug damage to the tomato on the right side, but there are beneficial stink bugs and predatory stink bugs, they're called. Notice that this is not a scientific term, but the pointed shoulders, you have the head, the thorax, and the, in the thorax region, you have these projections that are pointed, and that's typical of some of the good guys. It's true stink bug, but it, it goes after other insects. It's a predator and it likes caterpillars. So it's helping you out in the garden. And notice the one, the green stink bug that has more of the rounded sho shoulders, so to speak. That's a plant feeder. And then you have this leaf footed bug, which technically is a stink bug that plays havoc in our vegetable gardens. And it does the same thing as a green stink bug, it sticks its proboscis into the plant, into the fruit, and, and damages the plant. And they're very difficult to control with insecticides. And so here you see the nymphs at the bottom. It's interesting that the nymph of the leaf-footed bug, you can see that it gets the name leaf-footed. The hind legs have this leaf-like structure, but even in the nymph stage, you see that leaf-like structure where the assassin bug, which is uh, beneficial because it goes after other insects, lacks that, um, here's the assassin bug. It doesn't have the leaf-like structure on its hind legs. This is a nymph of the leaf-footed bug and this is a nymph of the leaf-footed bug. You need to learn those beneficials and try to protect them and encourage them. Very quickly on trap crops, I love to grow sunflowers in my garden. The pictures of the sunflowers are from my most recent uh, summer garden. I would go out daily and take pictures. All kinds of pollinators come into your garden because of the sunflowers. This happens to be a type of bee that loves sunflowers and butterflies. Uh, I just enjoy growing the sunflowers in my garden. But you can grow sorghum. You can grow millet for this purpose. By trap crops, you see on the millet, this is a millet seed head. You see those green stink bugs? They go to the trap crop and not as much to the desirable tomatoes or peppers or whatever you're growing. So that's what they mean by a trap crop. You have to plant them about the same time that you plant your tomatoes so that they're producing seed heads for the um, basically not only pollinators to come in, but it it causes these bad guys, in this case, the stink bugs, to move over onto the trap crops and not bother as much your desirable tomato plants. And then I've grown the buckwheat. 
Um, that can work or function as a trap crop as well. Some of these have a tendency to reseed themselves. So you might have them for a number of years after you use them the first time in your garden. Be aware of that. Nematodes, um, these are non-segmented microscopic roundworms that can play havoc in Florida's sandy soils. And again, use resistant varieties. That's one of our best options when you buy tomato seeds or tomato plants that have VFN. The V stands for verticillium uh, wilt. That's a fungal wilt, fusarium wilt, fungal wilt. And then the N stands for nematodes. It, it is high, those varieties are highly, or cultivars are highly resistant to nematodes. You see the root knot nematode evidence on the roots of this plant, and um, that's not good. And the solarization can be done, done correctly. You use clear plastic in the heat of summer, leave it in place for four to six weeks when you're not growing anything in the garden, and it Done correctly, it is a, as good as any of the older um, soil sterilants that we no longer have access to in reducing the nematode population, soil solarization. There's an excellent publication on EDIS on this. Common abiotic disorders, that's non-pest disorders, blossom drop, we covered some of that, temperature related, too much nitrogen. Deformed fruit can be caused by too much nitrogen. Um, some herbicides, blossom end rot, scale, sun scald, and then herbicide injury. Let's take a quick look at these. Tomato blossom drop, we've covered that. That's very uh, uh, disheartening when you got a nice plant coming along and under cool conditions early or the heat of summer, the pollination fertilization doesn't work correctly and or, or too much nitrogen, you start losing the blossoms and hence no fruit. This deformed fruit is something that happens from incomplete pollination, again, temperature related, mostly too much heat. Every once in a while, it could be caused chemically, primarily by a herbicide that was put in an adjacent lawn area. Tomatoes are very sensitive to 2,4-D type herbicides. Blossom end rot is not a disease. It's caused by the lack of calcium. It causes that sunken blossom end Notice the stem end, the blossom end where the flower was at is the part that's affected. There's not enough calcium moving through that plant to satisfy the needs of that growing fruit. And it simply, the cells simply collapse because of the lack of calcium. So again, a soil test can show you how much calcium you have. And if you need to adjust that, you can either use lime if you need to raise the pH. If the pH is where you need it, you can use gypsum what some people call land plaster. Sun's call is basically a sunburn. Um, not a whole lot we can do about that. Pruning the plant too much, taking away some of the shade from the foliage can increase sun's call. That's another reason why I do not like to over prune. I basically do not prune my tomato plants. Here's an example of herbicide injury, basically phenoxy type herbicide, 2,4-D. Tomatoes are extremely sensitive to this. Um, treating a nearby uh, adjacent lawn area and having some drift over on the tomato plants, you're very likely to see this malformed growth happen, twisted malformed leaves. So we're finishing up here, lots of additional information. If you're not familiar with our EDIS site, um, become familiar with it. You can find that also through Solutions for Your Life. Share this with some of the clientele you work with as master gardeners, homeowners. They, they many times, they, they will not know that this resource is available to them. And then encourage them to you know, visit your local extension office. So I appreciate the opportunity to share this presentation with you. I wish you the best in growing tomatoes in your own garden. I hope we caught you early enough before you make some of the same old mistakes. and Please share this with folks that come into the office looking for sound advice when you're functioning as a master gardener volunteer in your local extension office or at plant clinics and other places. Thank you. I will. Um, Super good timing, Larry. Um, we, we do have quite a few questions in the chat box um, and or in the question answer box, but everybody's saying thank you and how helpful it was. 
Um, so Larry, I'm supposed to be talking to the Monroe County Master Gardeners um, right around now. I kind of double, I backed up. I said, we'll be done at two. And I said, I'll be joining you guys about 2.05. Go, so, Wendy, go. <laughs> yeah, you know. Oh, someone Wendy has does a fabulous call. job, by the way, if the oh. folks listening do not. We're fortunate to have Wendy Wilbur as Thank the state you. master gardener coordinator. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Hey, so somebody is um, uh, wanting you to talk about the pruning versus non-pruning. So you say you don't really like to prune the indeterminates and... And we pretty much have been taught that over the years. So what do you think about that, Larry? I think if you know what you're doing and you know what pruning is, I didn't take time to, to show that, but take time to make sure you're pruning correctly. Pruning is taking out the lateral sucker growth. That, while it's small, about the, the diameter of the stem should be about pencil size or less. You can root those, by the way, if you want genetically the identical plant uh, that you were growing, but it, there's... It, it increases the maintenance. It can it can actually if you oh, if you prune too much, it takes out calcium, and it can increase blossom end rot problems. Um, it, it takes out some of the shade. I I typically prefer not to do it, but it's personal preference. But make sure if you do practice pruning, you know what the heck you're doing and how to correctly prune a tomato plant. Sounds good. Um, so the age old question, why did Florida tomatoes not taste so great? Uh, the, the, it's been bred out of them, basically. Um, the uh, You can't beat, in my opinion, the old heirloom types. I don't, that's not the bulk of what I grow because that one year that you have a high disease pressure and you don't get very much production, which was not the case with my most recent garden. I got terrific production out of the heirloom uh, types I grew. But I wouldn't go heavy hand with that, but they do have a better taste. I also think about, you know, if you're growing tomatoes in a more northern uh, latitude, um, they're getting more sunshine than we have in Florida, you know, towards if they're growing those summer crops. And so they can, I think they're getting more sugars into those fruits, maybe. Well, that's an excellent point, Wendy. I think there is truth to that. And if you, if you keep the plant overly vigorous, mm -hmm. I think that can impact, you know, too much nitrogen. But a variety, gen the genetics of the plant is the, the biggest factor, and, and they've bred a lot of that taste out, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and so when they're harvested, if they're harvested commercially, they pick them while they're still green. Right. That's um, the advantage to growing them in your garden. You can wait and pick the tomatoes when they're um, tastier. Definitely. Um, Janice has been very active in the box over here, but she says she has read that you should not fertilize after the flowers appear. Um, because then you will, you know, support more vegetative growth as opposed to reproductive growth. What's your opinion? I, I wouldn't say totally eliminate it, but definitely know that you need to gradually reduce the amount of it. It's the nitrogen that's the problem. The plant wants to continue to have the potassium. You have the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, always in that order. You should remember that, you know, in training. Uh, a lot of the homeowners you deal with don't know this, so you can educate them. But that first number, nitrogen, either needs to be a little bit lower as you, the plant begins to go into a reproductive mode or you decrease in using it and maybe use potassium nitrate or uh, just a, a, a lone sole, sole single source of potassium to supplement the potassium. Yeah, potassium is salt based. You don't want to overdo it either. Right. That's true. The calcium and the potassium are so important as that fruit is developing, as we know. A lot of homeowners overdo it with nitrogen and underdo it with potassium. It needs to be the dead opposite. Perfect. Perfect. Um, everybody, the recording will be um, on the website probably within, um, I would probably say within a week. Um, someone is asking about, does solarization also kill the good life in the soil? It might reduce it, but it doesn't eliminate it. And you know to, that's a great question because the better root environment that you have, if you start with a sandy soil, continue to add good organic matter because the more favorable root environment that you have, the better balance there is there. Um, the, in other words, the good guys eventually outnumber or out battle, so to speak, the bad guys. It, that really does happen in the soil. Um, the solarization is not permanent, 
done correctly, you can see a significant reduction in nematodes, but they will eventually return uh, slowly over a number of years. And they're, it's a numbers game. Is their, their number, you reach a threshold and the plants can no longer, the roots can no longer function correctly. Right. And I think that the, you know, they, they kind of outgrow the amount of roots that they have. You know, we have these big giant plants and we don't have the root base to, to get after it. And if you leave it in the soil year after, you know, month after month, the soil borne diseases pro proliferate as do the nematodes. So and that's where the rotation, rotating correctly, the Solanaceae family with some other family can, can help. That's a management tool for diseases, nematodes, even soil, some of the soil insects. Yeah. Truth, truth. Okay, Larry, everybody loved it. We had about 450 people at once. So that was great. Uh, I think for Brett, all, thank you. if you have uh, specific questions for Larry, um, you can reach him at his email um, and he can answer those for you too. Um, we got to got to cut the webinar a little bit shorter today, but Larry, thank you for your very comprehensive program. We loved it. And I, now we're all ready to go grow tomatoes. If you have too many tomatoes, just bring them to Crestview office and Larry will figure <laughs> out what to do with them. Thank um, you, Wendy. And thanks for those that joined in today. You know, we have the, the best master gardeners in Florida, master gardener volunteers. Uh, of the nation. Don't say Okaloosa is best. You're not saying that, are you? Well, I wasn't going to go there, but I'm saying Florida. I, I would put Ma Florida Master Gardener volunteers up against any other state. Yep. Me too. Me too. All right. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next month.